This program is brought to you by Teachers College, Columbia University. Please visit us online at itunes.tc.columbia.edu. Good morning and welcome everyone. The very first thing I want to do this morning is thank the person who made this occasion possible and that's Phyllis Kossov. Phyllis, where are you sitting? Would you stand up? Oh, there she is. <laughs> you can see the red hat. Um, Phyllis got her master's degree and she's been a firm supporter ever since, a staunch friend of the institution, a member of the President's Advisory Council. She's endowed a scholarship here and she is the sponsor of the Phyllis L. Kossoff Lecture in Education Policy, which we're inaugurating today. So thank you so much, Phyllis. And now to our main speaker for today, Secretary Duncan, on behalf of the entire Teachers College community, I want to say welcome. We're tremendously excited and honored to be hosting you today and especially pleased that you'll be talking about the issue of teacher preparation. Teacher education, of course, is central to uh, TC's mission and central to the leadership of the first dean of Teachers College, James Earl Russell who established the field of professional preparation for educators at the beginning of the 20th century. He believed that teacher education needed to rest on four pillars, general culture, special scholarship, professional knowledge, and technical skill. By general culture, Russell meant preparation, which would enable the student to see the relationships existing everywhere in various fields of knowledge and the unity of all knowledge. This was a critical point because it opened the door from the very first for Teachers College to offer courses in nutrition, psychology, nursing, and other fields not traditionally connected with schooling. By special scholarship, Russell meant content knowledge in one's own field, a knowledge of the field that is both comprehensive and evaluated, to quote him. By professional knowledge, he meant knowledge of the learner and learning of the history of education and of school administration, knowledge of the teacher, the student, and society. And by technical training, he meant pedagogy. The artist in every vocation must have consummate skills in the use of his tools. The teacher must be skilled in the techniques of his art, he said. Secretary Duncan, these same propositions are central to the work of Teachers College today, and as the record clearly shows, uh, to your own as well. During your seven years as chief executive of Chicago's public schools, the number of teachers applying for positions nearly tripled. The number of teachers achieving national board certification increased um, to over 1,000, over 1,100 in 2008, compared to just 11 a decade earlier. This is the fastest growing urban district in this regard. And the results for students are nothing short of inspiring. During that same period, an all-time high of 66.7% of elementary school students in Chicago met or exceeded state reading standards, and their math scores were also at a record high. Students in Chicago's public schools posted gains on the um, ACT at three times the rate of national gains and nearly twice that of the state, and the number of high school students taking advanced placement courses tripled. The number of students passing AP classes more than doubled. Graduation rates increased significantly, and the total number of college scholarships secured by Chicago public school students climbed to 157 million. And there are many other aspects of what you've accomplished both in Chicago and during the months since you became Education Secretary that dovetail closely with our efforts at Teachers College. You made Chicago the primary theater for piloting the concept of the community school. That is, the school is a provider of academic, recreational, and social service programs for students, parents, and other community residents. That's too a concept, that, too, is a concept that's been at the heart of Teachers College's vision since its inception. In fact, in the early 20th century, Teachers College founded the Spire School on 126th Street, a school that was open from 8 a.m. until 10 p.m., and that served all the community's residents, students, parents, and others. And now, 
under the leadership of our new office and school and community partnerships, we are seeking to reestablish uh, Teachers College Community School here in Harlem, a pre-K through eight school that would also be the hub of its entire community. In recent months, you've championed two major pieces of legislation making their way through Congress, on the, one on the quality of early childhood education with $8 billion attached, and another on bolstering the performance of community colleges with $12 billion attached. And both those areas are strengths at at, here at Teachers College and have been uh, shaped by our own uh, faculty's efforts, Sharon Lynn Kagan and, and Tom Bailey, uh, respectively. And you've lent powerful impetus to the promising new consensus that is emerging around the notion of common core learning standards in English and math, work which, again, researchers at Teachers College have played a part in. And we also have something else in common. You're from Chicago, and Chicago and Teachers College share the legacy of one of the greatest thinkers in American education, John Dewey, whose 150th, 150th birthday was celebrated this week. Beyond even these areas of overlap, Secretary Duncan, you have demonstrated that valuable and all too rare skill in the field of education, the ability to unite parents, teachers, principals, and business stakeholders behind an aggressive reform agenda. You've worked in the trenches in all areas and at all levels of education, starting a, sc a school, helping to fund college educations for inner city kids, and you even worked with children who were wards of the state in Australia. And most of all, you believe passionately, as we do, in the critical importance of education to the life chances of each individual and to the future of our country. Or as you yourself has so eloquently put it, education is the civil rights issue of our generation, the only sure path out of poverty, and the only way to achieve a more equal and just society. Mr. Secretary, we're eager to hear your vision for improving teacher preparation, and we're excited about working together with you in the future to make it a reality. Secretary Duncan. Thank you so much for that kind introduction, Susan. Before I begin, let's give her a huge round of applause. We're so lucky to have her here at Teachers College. Susan's an absolute dynamo, as you know, and I'm just so proud of what's going on here. It's an, it's an honor, an absolute honor and a pleasure to be here at Columbia Teachers College, the oldest, the largest, and the most storied graduate school of education in the United States. Here is the citadel of teacher preparation, where giants, and Susan talked about them, like John Dewey played such a formative role. I've come to speak to you today about the need for a sea change in our nation's schools of education. Like the Teachers College, many schools of education have provided high quality preparation programs for aspiring teachers for decades. In the last decade, a slew of education schools have also upgraded their programs or launched rigorous practice-based initiatives to adapt to the realities of preparing instructors to teach diverse students in our information age. I'm going to talk about some of those shining examples in just a moment. Yet, by almost any standard, many, if not most, of the nation's 1,450 schools, colleges, and departments of education are doing a mediocre job of preparing teachers for the realities of the 21st century classroom. America's university-based teacher preparation programs need revolutionary change, not evolutionary tinkering. Despite the obstacles to reform, I am absolutely optimistic that the seeds for real change are being planted and will bear fruit. America, America faces three great educational challenges that make the need to improve teacher preparation programs all the more urgent. First, the education that millions of Americans got in the past simply won't do anymore. In the information age, it is impossible, it is impossible to drop out of school and land a good job. Even workers with high school diplomas, but without college degrees, are going to find they have very limited opportunities in a competitive global economy. As President Obama has said, education is no longer just a pathway to opportunity and success, it's a prerequisite to success. Second, education, as Horace Mann said nearly two centuries ago, has long been the great equalizer in our country. No matter what your race, your national origin, disability, or zip code, every single child is entitled to a quality public education. Today, more than ever, we acknowledge America's need and a public school's obligation
to teach all students, all students, to their full potential. And yet today, we are still far from achieving that dream of equal educational opportunity. Nearly 30% of our students today drop out or fail to complete high school on time. That's 1.2 million children every single year. Barely 60% of African and Latino students graduate on time. And in many cities, half or more of low-income teens drop out of school. Those statistics, those facts are absolutely unacceptable. As Susan said, I believe that education is the civil rights issue of our generation. And if you care about promoting opportunity and reducing inequality, about promoting civic knowledge and participation, the classroom is the place we need to start. Children today in our neediest schools are more likely to have the least qualified teachers. And that's why great teaching is about so much more than education. It is absolutely a daily fight for social justice. Now, the nation's rising educational demands are only half the picture. The third force propelling the nation's need for more and better teachers is a massive exodus of baby boomers from the teaching force over the course of the next decade. We currently have about 3.2 million teachers who work in some 95,000 schools. But more than half of those teachers and principals are baby boomers. And during the next four years, we could lose a third of our veteran teachers and school leaders to retirement and attrition. By 2014, just five short years from now, we project that up to a million new teaching positions will need to be filled by new teachers. These major demographic shifts mean that teaching is going to be a booming profession in the years ahead, with school districts nationwide making up to 200,000 new first-time hires every single year. Our ability to attract and more importantly retain great talent over the next five years will shape public education in our country for the next 30. It is truly a once in a generation shift. It's important to emphasize that the challenge of our schools is not just the looming teacher shortage, but rather a shortage of great teachers in schools and communities where they are needed the most. As Lyndon Johnson foresaw in 1965, he said tomorrow's teachers must not merely be plentiful enough, they must be good enough. They must possess the old virtues of energy and dedication, and they must possess new knowledge and new skill. In our new era of accountability, it is not enough for a teacher to say, I taught it, but the students didn't learn it. As Linda Darling Hammond has pointed out, that is akin to saying, the operation was a success, but the patient died. More than 40 years after Johnson spoke, high poverty, high need schools still struggle to attract and retain great talent. Teacher, teacher openings in science and math, subjects that are so critically important to our students' future, are often hard to fill with effective instructors. And students with disabilities and English language learners are still underserved. Rural classrooms are facing teacher shortages, and we have far too few teachers of color. Nationwide, more than 35% of public school students are Hispanic or African American, but less than 15% of our teachers are black or Latino. That's a problem that is not self-correcting, and we must proactively work together to fix it. It is especially troubling that less than 2% of our nation's teachers are African American males. To keep America competitive and to make the American dream of equal education opportunity a reality, we need to recruit, reward, train, learn from, and honor a new generation of talented teachers. But the bar must be raised for successful teacher preparation programs because we ask so much more today of teachers than we did even a decade ago. Today, teachers are asked to achieve significant academic growth for all students at the same time they instruct students with ever more diverse and complicated needs. Teaching has never been more difficult, it has never been more important, and the desperate need for more student success has never been more urgent. Are we adequately preparing future teachers to win in this critical battle? I am urging every teacher preparation program today to make better outcomes for students the overarching mission that propels every single one of their efforts. America's great educational challenges require that this new generation of well-prepared teachers significantly boost student learning and increase college and career readiness. President Obama has set an ambitious, an ambitious goal of having America regain its position as a nation with the highest proportion of college graduates in the world by 2020. 
But to reach that goal, both our K-12 system and our teacher preparation programs have to get dramatically better. The stakes are huge, and the time to cling to the status quo has passed. Now, there's a reason why so many of us remember a favorite teacher forever. A great teacher can literally change the course of a student's life. They light a lifelong curiosity, a desire to participate in democracy, and instill a thirst for knowledge. It is no surprise that studies repeatedly document that the single biggest influence on student academic growth is the quality of the teacher standing in front of the classroom. Not socioeconomic status, not family background, but the quality of the teacher in front of that class. Earlier this month, at Thomas Jefferson's fabled rotunda at the University of Virginia, I issued a call to teaching as an essential national mission of our time. But the fact is that recruiting and preparing this army of great new teachers depends heavily on our nation's colleges of education. More than half of tomorrow's teachers will be trained at schools of education. The U.S. Department of, Edu of Education estimates the schools and departments of education produce about 220,000 certified teachers a year. Now, I'm all in favor of expanding high-quality alternative certification routes, like High Tech High, the New Teacher Project, Teach for America, and teacher residency programs. But these promising alternative programs will produce fewer than 10,000 teachers per year. The predominance of education schools in preparing teachers is not the only reason this is a national priority and a critical concern for higher education. My good friend, Congressman George Miller from California, the chair of the House Committee on Education and a great reform advocate, points out that America's taxpayers already, already generously support teacher preparation programs. And it's only right that this investment should be well spent. In the 2007-2008 school year, nearly 30% of undergraduate education majors received Pell Grants totaling close to a billion dollars. That same year, about 40% of undergraduate education ma majors received $3 billion in federal student loans. All told, the federal government now provides about $4 billion a year in Pell Grants and federal loans to support students and our university-based teacher preparation programs. At the same time, graduate schools of education have a huge impact on post-baccalaureate enrollment. They award nearly 30% of all master's degrees, more than any other branch of graduate studies. And unlike independent alternative certification programs, university-based teacher, program, teacher preparation programs have unique advantages. They, have, they are financially self-sustaining. They have math and science departments on campus to assist in specialized training. They can provide rich content knowledge in the liberal arts, and they are in a position to research and test what works and what doesn't to improve student learning. Now, it's not possible to talk honestly about radical improvements to teacher preparation programs without acknowledging the troubled history of education schools and stubborn barriers to reform. To echo a sentiment voiced by deans of education schools, Almost since colleges of education came into being, they have frequently been treated like the Rodney Dangerfield of higher education. Historically, education schools were the institution that got no respect, from the Oval Office to the Provost's Office, from university presidents to secretaries of education. From the onset of education schools a century ago, they have been beset by skeptics who were the teachers were simply born, not made. In William James' popular lectures, Talks to Teachers on Psychology, published in 1899, James warned that educators made, quote, a very great mistake in assuming that child psychology could help provide methods of instruction for immediate schoolroom use. James thought that teaching was an instinctual art, and many of his colleagues in academia agreed that teaching was more a craft than a profession. In his book, The Uncertain Profession, former Ed School Administrator Arthur Powell argued that none of the social sciences spawned by the American University at the end of the 19th century has a more volatile and more troublesome history than the field of education. The dismissal of teacher preparation programs by the liberal arts faculty on many campuses was so complete that in the 1930s, the president of Harvard described Harvard's graduate school of education as, quote, a kitten that ought to be drowned. Columbia itself was not exempt from soul-searching about the effectiveness of colleges of education. In 1944, on the occasion of the 50th anniversary of Teachers College, 
Harvard President James Bryan Conant gave a speech here calling for a truce among educators, a plea he acknowledged that fell on deaf ears. Nearly 20 years later, Conant authored a two-year study of education schools that acknowledged many students believe that the required courses they took were Mickey Mouse courses. Jacques Barzun, who wrote the classic bestseller Teacher in America and later went on to be Columbia's provost, was equally unsparing in his critique of education schools. In his essay, The Art of Making Teachers, he wrote that teacher training is based on a strong anti-intellectual bias enhanced by a total lack of imagination. Jump forward to 1963, and you find that President Kennedy was voicing many of the same concerns about the quality of educational research that continue to resound to this day. Research in education, President Kennedy declared, has been astonishingly meager and frequently ignored. It is appalling that so little is known about the level of performance, comparative value of alternative investments, and specialized, specialized programs of our educational system. More than three decades later, not much, or at least not enough, has changed. In 1995, the Holmes Group, a coalition of ed school deans, issued a pointed report warning that, quote, the education school should cease to act as a silent agent in the preservation of the status quo. In 1999, Richard Riley, one of my predecessors as Secretary of Education, told the National Press Club that we can no longer fiddle around the edges of how we recruit, prepare, retain, and reward America's teachers. Our colleges of education can no longer be the sleepy backwaters. Now, as you know, the most recent comprehensive study of education schools was carried out by Arthur Levine, the former president of Teachers College. Levine's 2006 study found numerous examples of exemplary programs. But he also documented the persistence of problems that had afflicted ed schools for decades. At the moment, he wrote, teacher education is the dodge city of the education world, unruly and disordered. The bottom line is that we lack empirical evidence of what works in, in preparing teachers for an outcome-based education system. We don't know what, where, how, or when teacher education is most effective. Ed school deans and faculty interviewed for Levine's study painted an unflattering picture of teacher education, which they, which they complained was subjective, obscure, faddish, out of touch, too politically correct, and failed to address the burning problems in the nation's schools. English professor E.D. Hirsch, the father of the acclaimed content-rich core knowledge program, got his own taste of the ideological blinders at colleges of education when he chose to teach an ed, ed school course on the cause and the cure of the achievement gap. Having authored the 1987 bestseller, Cultural Literacy, Hirsch anticipated that his course would be overflowing with students. But three years in a row, only 10 students were so enrolled. Finally, one of his students informed Hirsch that other professors in the ed school were encouraging students to shun, to avoid the course, because it ran counter to their pedagogical beliefs. More than three out of five ed school alums surveyed for the Levine Report said that training did not prepare them adequately for their work in the classroom. In my seven years as CEO of the Chicago Public Schools and in my current job as I've traveled the country, I've had literally hundreds of conversations with great teachers. And they echo many of the same concerns about ed schools voiced in the Levine Report and in earlier decades. In particular, they say two things about the training they received. First, most of them didn't feel they did not get the hands-on, practical teacher training about managing the classroom that they desperately needed, especially when working in impoverished communities. And second, they were not taught how to use data to differentiate and improve instruction and boost student learning. On Tuesday night, two days ago, at a national town hall meeting with teachers, I asked a studio audience of about 100 teachers how they felt about their preparation that they received in their schools of ed and uneasy laughter filled the room, not the kind of response that engenders confidence. Now the obvious question arises, why have teacher preparation programs historically been difficult to reform? And how is it that in the face of this history, I'm actually very optimistic that important changes are already underway in our nation's teacher preparation programs? Let me start by answering that first question about the obstacles to reform. It is far too simple to blame colleges of education for the slow pace. In fact, universities, 
states, and the federal government have all impeded reform in a variety of ways. For decades, schools of education have been renowned for being cash cows for universities. The large enrollment in education schools and the relatively low overhead have made them profit centers. But many universities have diverted those profits to more prestigious but under-enrolled graduate programs like physics, while doing little to invest back in rigorous educational research and well-run clinical training. This robbing Peter to pay Paul is extraordinarily short-sighted. If teaching is and should be one of our most revered professions, teacher preparation programs should be among the university's most important responsibilities. Unfortunately, this is often the exception, not the norm. It takes a university to prepare a teacher. The arts and science faculty play an absolutely essential role in strengthening the content knowledge of aspiring teachers. I do not understand when college presidents and deans of the arts and science faculty ignore their teacher preparation programs and yet then turn around and complain about the cost of providing remedial classes to their incoming freshmen. Simply put, too many income, incoming freshmen don't know the content because they've been taught by teachers whose own content knowledge is insufficient. In my view, Donald Kennedy, the former president of Stanford University, got it right when he said that only if the best institutions care about public schools and their own schools of education will the public think they are worth caring about. And nothing could be more clearly the business of America's academic leaders. Now, the fact is that states, districts, and the federal government are also all culpable for the persistence of weak teacher preparation programs. Most states routinely approve teacher education programs, and licensing exams typically measure basic skills and subject matter knowledge with paper and pencil tests without any real-world assessment of classroom readiness. Local mentoring programs for new teachers are often poorly funded and poorly organized at the district level. Less than a handful of states and districts carefully track the performance of teachers to their teacher preparation programs to identify which programs are producing well-prepared teachers and which programs are not turning out effective teachers. We should be studying and copying the practices of effective teacher preparation programs and encouraging the lowest performers to shape up or to shut down. Even the failure of some education schools to develop a rigorous research-based curriculum cannot solely be laid at their doorstep. We all know that the reading and math wars have gone on for decades, but that doesn't mean they are destined to last forever. Thanks to the National Reading Panel and other national expert assessments, educators know much more about the science of teaching reading and math today than we did a decade ago. Yet as your President Susan Furman recently pointed out, countries like Singapore and South Korea and the Czech Republic that outperform us, in, outperform us in science and math provide their teachers with much clearer guidance on key ideas and content to be mastered in each grade. Now, each of these barriers to reform that I've just cited is beginning to slowly recede. And that was one reason why I remain so optimistic that real improvements and change to teacher, to teacher education programs are underway. For the first time, 48 states have banded together to develop common college and career ready standards for high school students. And the federal government is providing generous incentives through the Race to the Top Fund to encourage rigorous standards, including setting aside $350 million to fund the competitive development of better assessments for our nation's students. Just a year ago, many education experts would have doubted states could ever agree on common college ready and career ready standards. The race of top criteria would also reward states that publicly report and link student achievement data to the programs where teachers and principals were credentialed. And the federal government is funding a large expansion of teacher residency programs in high need districts and schools, including one to be run right out of the teachers, teachers college right here. As you know, teacher residency programs follow a medical model of training, with residents placed in schools with extensive induction and support during a year-long apprenticeship. In Chicago, I was lucky enough to work with the Academy of Urban School Leadership, one of the nation's top residency programs. The U.S. Department of Education recently announced $43 million in grants for 28 teacher quality partnership programs that went to colleges of education in high-need school districts, with more than half of the five-year grants supporting residency programs. An additional $100 million in grants 
included in the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, will be awarded early next year. We want to be part of the solution here. At the state and the district level, states like Louisiana are leading the way in building longitudinal data systems that enable states to track and compare the impact of new teachers from one teacher, re one teacher preparation program on student achievement over a period of years. Louisiana's system is already up and running, linking teacher education programs in the state back to student performance and growth in math, in English, in reading, in science, and in social studies. All students in Louisiana in grades four through nine who took one of the state's assessments are eligible for inclusion in Louisiana's evaluation of teacher impact. And the state uses three years of data involving hundreds of thousands of students and tens of thousands of teachers. Louisiana is using the information to identify effective and ineffective programs for the first time. And university-based teacher education programs are using this outcome data to revamp and strengthen their programs. Officials at the University of Louisiana at Lafayette decided to increase admissions requirements, added a career counseling program to better prepare teachers for the transition into the classroom, and boosted coursework requirements in English language arts. Real change based upon the real outcomes of children. Pretty remarkable. Right now, Louisiana is the only state in the nation that tracks the effectiveness of its teacher preparation programs. Every state in the nation should be doing the same. And as I said, we're going to provide incentives for states to do so in the $4.3 billion race to the top competition. It's a simple but obvious idea. Colleges of education and district officials ought to know which teacher preparation programs are effective and which need fixing. Transparency, longitudinal data, thoughtful self-examination we think can be powerful tonics for programs stuck in the past. Several districts are moving to track their impact of teacher preparation programs and outcomes. Here in New York, the Teacher Policy Research Project, sponsored by the University of Albany and Stanford University, recently assessed the impact that 31 elementary teacher preparation programs had on math and English achievement in New York City. They found that the difference between the average impact of the 31 teacher preparation programs and the top value-added institution for first-year teachers was about the same as the difference in average learning for a classroom of predominantly low-income students and those in a classroom where there weren't those poverty rates. The New York study is yet another example of how we can finally beginning to get comparative data on educational investments that President Kennedy called for so long ago. Now, just as states and districts are beginning to link teacher education programs to student outcomes, universities are also taking the responsibility to improve teacher education much more seriously. I've been involved in a listening and learning tour over the last nine months that's taken me to over 30 states. Everywhere I go, I see universities partnering with school districts, opening up lab schools and magnet schools and traditional schools and charter schools, and creating professional development schools for ed school students to gain clinical experience. In droves, universities have opened their doors to alternative certification programs and are paying greater attention to the quality and the supervision of student teachers during that critically important clinical training. As you know, the accreditation of schools of education is a voluntary process, and historically coursework has been given greater priority than clinical training for students in accreditation. But there are also encouraging signs that colleges of education want to make self-policing more meaningful with clinical experience driving coursework. Both NCATE, the National Council for the Accreditation of Teacher Education, and AACTE, the American Association of Colleges for Teacher Education, are both firmly behind the new drive to link teacher preparation programs to better student outcomes. In June, NCATE and its president, Jim Sabulka, announced the first major revision of teacher education requirements in a decade. It includes new accreditation requirements that will oblige institutions to strengthen the clinical focus of their programs and foster demonstrable increases in student learning. NCATE's new accreditation system will be modeled in part on Tennessee's evolving experiment, where the Board of Regents has decided that all undergraduate teacher candidates will spend their senior year in year-long residencies in K-12 schools. I hope other states and schools of education shift more to a residency model of training. 
Under the leadership of Sharon Robinson, the AACTE and its 800 colleges and universities have made it a core mission to have pre-service education lead to substantial increases in student achievement. AACTE has also recently launched a series of new programs and initiatives designed to improve their teachers' effectiveness. One of their most promising initiatives to date is the development of the first nationally accessible assessment of teacher candidate readiness. Under this performance-based assessment, supervising teachers and faculty would evaluate student teachers in the classroom, and student teachers and interns would be required to plan and teach a week-long stint of instruction mapped to state standards and provide commentaries on videotapes of their instruction in classroom management. AACTE's project is based on PACT, California's Performance Assessment for Teachers, which Linda Darling Hammond and a wide-ranging consortium of teacher preparation programs in California have done so much to pioneer. Already 14 states have signed up to pilot the performance assessment. In the end, I don't think the ingredients of a good teacher preparation program are much of a mystery anymore. Our best programs are, co are coherent, up-to-date, research-based, and provide students with subject mastery. They have a strong and substantial field-based program in local public schools that drives much of the coursework in classroom management and in student learning, and prepares students to teach diverse students in high-needs settings. And these programs have a shared vision of what constitutes good teaching and best practices, including a single-minded focus on improving student learning and using data to inform instruction. The program right here at Teachers College, which turns out about 700 teachers a year explicitly train students to use data to continuously improve their own instruction and target student learning gaps. Every student teacher in the elementary program here at TC completes at least two semesters of student teaching. And unlike some education schools, every student teacher here works under the careful supervision of a well-qualified mentor teacher. About half of TC's graduating teachers in 2007-2008 ended up in high-need schools right here in New York City. Finally, your commitment to research what really works to advance student learning is impressive. And I thank you so much for the example you continue to set. Earlier this month, I spoke to students at the Curry School of Education at the University of Virginia and found a similar top-notch program where fifth-year students teach full-time during the first semester. David Steiner is here, your great new commissioner in New York. Give him a round of applause. <laughs> And I think David created an extraordinary teacher pr preparation program at Hunter College. Like Virginia's program, it had a carefully run clinical program that videotapes student teachers and helps them learn from their experience. In contrast to some colleges of education, David also encouraged the incorporation of best practices from a new generation of high-performing charter schools. He even established an alternative certification program for teachers of record, Teacher U, for KIPP, Achievement First, and the Uncommon Schools. There are many other first-rate teacher preparation programs, Stanford University, the University of Washington, and Michigan, just to name a few. But I want to be absolutely clear that it doesn't take an elite university or a big endowment to create great teacher education programs. At, em <laughs> At Emporia State University in Emporia, Kansas, home of the National Teachers Hall of Fame, the Teachers College is the crown jewel of the school. Roughly 80% of the students are supervised by full-time education faculty instead of by adjuncts, and all elementary education professors are in public schools every day. Senior year is a 100% field-based program in Emporia's public schools where student teachers do everything from assisting grading to sitting in on parent-teacher conferences. Alverno College, a Catholic women's college in Milwaukee, also requires a rigorous field experience in the public schools, and as faculty and local principals access videotapes of student teachers. 85% of, Al of Alverno's graduates are still in the classroom five years after graduation, an extraordinarily high retention rate. At Black Hill State University in Spearfish, South Dakota, Project Prime, a partnership with the Rapid City Schools, uses school-based math coaches and graduate-level courses for teachers to successfully boost math achievement among Native American students. I cite all these examples to point out that with courage and with commitment, 
Our teacher preparation programs absolutely can provide dynamic and effective preparation for the 21st century, leaving the sleepy backwaters that Secretary Riley spoke about in, the, in our rearview mirror. In place of the uncertain profession, I want to see teacher preparation programs one day rival those of other professions. When the Elementary and Secondary Education Act is reauthorized, we will be reinvesting in teacher education programs. We will encourage partnerships with states and districts that address teacher shortages, particularly in high-need areas. And we, will and, we will, and we will encourage programs committed to results, programs that use data, including student achievement data, to foster an ethic of continuous improvement, both for students and for teachers. Our best teacher preparation programs see the smart use of data as a boon that can help them improve, not as a burden. They see competition from alternative providers not as a threat, but as a force from which they can learn and benefit and share ideas. It's often said that great teachers are unsung heroes, but for me, that truism has real, real meaning. Teaching is one of the few professions that is not just a job or even an adventure. It is a calling. Great teachers strive to help every student unlock their potential and develop the habits of mind that will serve them for a lifetime. They believe that every child, every student has a gift, even when those students don't see it in themselves. Henry Adams said that a teacher affects eternity, and he can never tell when his influence stops. That is a weighty responsibility and an absolutely unique privilege. I thank you for all that you have done and will do to train the next generation of great teachers. The challenges facing our nation's schools of education are great, but so too is the opportunity to better serve our children and the common good. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Mr. Secretary. We still have some time remaining for questions, and we have a diminished number of microphones. We have one in the middle of the aisle over here, one over here. Uh, for those of you who have questions, I would ask you to queue up behind them. And again, remember, we're hoping that you can be focused in your, in your questions and that the Secretary won't take less time to answer your question than you do to ask it. There you go. So. Yes, sir. Yes, uh, good, good uh, afternoon. Um, I'm a student at Teachers College, and uh, I'm concerned with a lot of these issues that you talked about. Um, but I'm, I want to ask you about um, No Child Left Behind, because I think that your initiative, Race to the Top, is in response to the kind of general, um, the general sentiment of many state and local governments of setting low standards in order to fulfill uh, the standards of No Child Left Behind. And I wanted to know your thoughts on what can we do with No Child Left Behind so that, so that uh, focus of state and local governments uh, kind of being concerned with standards that they're, that they're lowering the achievement of their students, ex expectations of their students, how can, that be, how can that be addressed? Well, there's a lot that I think we need to work on and fix as we move into reauthorization and as we go, move into the new calendar year. We're going to get that going. A couple basic points is that, as you said, under No Child Left Behind, we had 50 states doing their own thing, 50 different standards, 50 different goalposts, and in many places, including the state where I come from, from Illinois, those standards got dummy down. And I've argued that in many places, we're actually lying to children. Let me explain what I mean. When a child is told and a parent is told they are, quote, unquote, meeting a state standard, they feel they're probably in pretty good shape. In many places, that bar is so low, that child who is, quote, unquote, meeting that standard is barely able to graduate from high school and is woefully underprepared to go to a competitive university, let alone graduate. So what we're seeing now, and the leadership really isn't being provided by me, it's being provided by you know, 48 governors, New York's in the mix, 48 state school chiefs. We have all these folks coming together to raise the bar collectively. And what we want to do is we want to be much looser on how you get to that higher goal, but have a high standard. On a no child left behind, they're loose on the goal, very tight, very prescriptive on how you get there. I want to have a tight goal, a high bar, but really let local educators innovate and be entrepreneurial, hold them accountable for results, but help them get to that higher bar. So we're trying to fundamentally change that mix there. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Sam Silverstein, Columbia University. You spoke eloquently just a, 
about an hour ago at a previous meeting and now here about the importance of faculties of arts and sciences and the collaboration between uh, teachers and universities. What in the legislation and in the monies that are forthcoming uh, will be incentives for state and city departments of education to partner in real dollar terms with uh, the tremendous resources that exist in the communities in our educational, higher educational institutions that will allow this kind of collaboration actually to bear fruit? Well, the opportunity we have that I think people here understand is our department has never had the kind of discretionary resources we have. We've largely been this compliance driven, just formula based uh, organization, department. Secretary Page had $17 million in discretionary resources. We have more than $10 billion, you know, exponential difference. What we want to do simply is invest in what works. And we want to put unprecedented resources behind states, behind districts, behind nonprofits, behind universities that are collaborating to do a couple things. They're closing the achievement gap, they're raising the bar, and they're making sure many more students are prepared for some kind of post-secondary education, four-year universities, two-year community colleges, trade, vocational, technical training, whatever it might be. And so we simply want to invest in what works. We have great, great carrots. And uh, places that are making a difference every single day, we want to take those best practices to scale. And so we're going to look at the data. We're going to look at where folks are really showing the ability to, to close that gap and raise the bar for every student. And if it's working for, you know, in a school or in a community or in a district, we want to take that to an entirely different level. Thank you, sir. Um, I'm a graduate of Teachers College and presently a 4-H camp director. 4-H uh, camps are connected to land-grant university research, a lot of our programs. And I think one of the reasons I got into camping was because of a Richard Rothstein book, uh, a visiting lecturer here. Uh, he had research about the importance of summer opportunities for children. And this summer we had a, an alumni event, and it seemed the anecdotal evidence was that a lot of our uh, former staff pursued careers in education. Uh, so camping in general being a, a training ground for, for future teachers. And in lieu of uh, comments last month about uh, extending school days and school years, I'm curious what your, your ideas or, or possible plans might be for partnering with, with summer camps as an alternative to replacing them. Well, I'm all for camping, and I'm, I'm a city kid, so I think getting out of the city and getting out uh, and, and increasing exposure is really, really important. And so to me, let me be clear, this is not about replacing summer camps. I don't worry about the students who are going to summer camps. They're going to do real well. I worry about the millions of students who don't have the resources to go to summer camps, who don't have the opportunity to go to summer camps, who are basically wasting away during the summer. And so this is not a competition or a battle. This is about making sure every child has much higher quality options to learn, to grow, to explore the world, to get out and get, you know, get beyond their community. And, uh, you know, we don't need another study on summer reading loss. We got plenty of studies that show us that poor children get to a certain point in June, teachers have worked really hard, and they come back to us in September, and they're further behind than when they left. Something's wrong with that picture. And so I worry a lot about disadvantaged students that will never have the opportunity to do that. And so how do we give more students academic support, academic enrichment, how do we get them exposure to summer camps, how do we get more of our fifth and sixth and seventh graders onto college campuses in the summer, so I start to think that world is part of who they can be. All these things we have to do to more and do it collaboratively. To me, there's no competition. It's not about replacing summer camps. It's the overwhelming majority of students who have never had those options. That's what I'm worried about. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Dewana Smith from TC. Uh, in New York State, their home and career skills are mandated to be taught in the middle school uh, public I'm sorry, can you speak up a little bit? I'm sorry. Yes. In New York State, the home and career skills are, are mandated to be taught in middle schools, however, I know they are not. How are you going to monitor whether the schools in the nation are addressing your new policies and mandates? Uh, we're really trying to change our role from being this big sort of federal oversight to investing in it, what works and scaling what works and putting lots of resources behind places that are making a difference. And so we're going to put hundreds of millions of dollars behind folks that are doing the right thing by children, and places that aren't are going to be challenged. Um, I will tell you that where we're going to take a little bit of a tougher line and uh, is really on places where you have chronic student underachievement. 
Uh, I talked about dropouts. We have about 2,000 high schools that produce half our nation's dropouts. Those 2,000 high schools produce 75% of our dropouts from the African-American Latino community. We have to collectively do some different things, and we're not going to have all the answers, but we're going to really challenge states and districts and nonprofits and universities and unions that we all need to come together and do something better in those situations. So we really want to reward excellence. But where things aren't working, we're going to shine a real spotlight on it. Thank you. Um, I'm a teacher in high needs schools. And Besides teacher training, I wanted you to speak a little bit. You mentioned it um, in your speech, but could you expand upon how you are going to work to reward teachers who are high quality teachers, high performing teachers in high need schools in order to decrease um, all of the teacher turnover that often exists yeah. in high need schools, yeah. whether it's monetary or other sorts of programs that you see um, that would help these teachers? I I think monetary can be a piece of it, but no good teacher is going to go to a really tough school for $5,000. They'll laugh at you. Um, that's not good. You know, teachers aren't motivated by money. They can come into education to make a million dollars. What we have to do, we talk so much about the achievement gap. I'm really focused on what I call the opportunity gap. And you just described the opportunity gap. I'm convinced if more poor children, if more disadvantaged children had the best teachers working with them, they would do well. Because we know so often the children who need the best get the least, get the most inexperienced, have the highest turnover. So how do we do this collectively? Uh, if, you talk, if you ask teachers, and we, you know, I ask this, everywhere I go, I ask teachers, what does it take? First of all, it takes a great principal. You need great leadership. You need better working conditions. You need folks working together. Teachers want more time to work together and plan. And they have to go on critical mass. If you send two teachers into a dysfunctional situation, they'll be overwhelmed and get run out. You send 40 teachers into that situation, and they start to become the culture. And so I think we should use some financial resources, but if we think money alone is going to solve this, that's wrong. I also think we should pay math and science teachers more. We don't have enough math and science. We've had a math and science teacher shortage for 30 years. I, let's, I want to stop talking about it. And I think um, teachers who take on those toughest assignments, I think everyone in society, including other teachers, would really respect that they do deserve some additional dollars. But I just want to be clear, the additional dollars should happen, but that's never going to be the answer. It's going to be a small piece of the answer. Yes, my name is Lori Spear. I'm a Teachers College graduate, and I taught for 15 years in New York City Elementary School. And for the last three years, I've been teacher training for Reading Reform Foundation. And um, I thought that you laid out the problems and a lot of the solutions very well. But based on my own experience and that of many teachers with whom I'm familiar, one of the missing um, pieces for elementary school teachers particularly those who teach kindergarten, first, second, and third grade, is that those teachers have received no training on how to teach the basics of reading. Mm -hmm. And without that knowledge, they cannot be effective in helping the beginning reader make that journey. The children who aren't exposed to this are the kids who later on become our problem children and our dropouts. So my question is, what plans do you have for incorporating a multi-sensory phonics-based reading program as part of basic teacher training for elementary school teachers? Again, we're just going to look to those places that are getting great results for students. And it's hard to get great results from, teach, for, from students if teachers don't have those fundamental skills to teach reading. And so that's got to be a huge, huge focus. I worry not just our, about our inability to teach reading. I worry about so many of our students who we don't teach to read end up in special education. And it's many of our African-American Latino boys. 60% of going to special education are labeled LD. They're labeled LD because they don't know how to read. And so, and what's amazing to me is once a child goes into special education, they never come out. It's never like for two years and you're out of special. You're there for a lifetime. And so, the, as you've lived, the profound implications of not teaching reading early are very, very significant, and making sure those teachers have those skills is critically important. I'll go one step further, and it wasn't the, the, the topic today, but I think we have to dramatically improve what we're doing in early childhood education. I think we have to have a lot more students hit kindergarten ready to learn and ready to read. And I worry today that the best, in the best kindergarten teachers in the world have this huge disparity of children coming into the classroom, children who are reading fluently and have the socialization skills intact, and other children who don't know the front of a book from the back of a book, who've never been read to. And I don't know how the best teacher manages that, that, that disparity. 
So part of what we're doing is an unprecedented investment in early childhood education to dramatically increase quality and to increase access. And if we can do that and couple that with the better teacher training that you're talking about early on, then I think we fundamentally break through. Let's do two more, one, two, and then I have to close. I, I apologize, one, two. Uh, good Last morning, two. Mr. Secretary. Um, as an undergrad, I noticed that many of uh, my most talented uh, peers chose not to go into teaching because they knew that they would never be rewarded up to their, up to their ability. Uh, my question for you is what, you, what resources you intend to commit to attracting the highest talent in the country? So we're, we're looking very uh, <laughs> intensively at how do we reward excellence. And I think in education we've been a little bit scared to talk about excellence and how do we reward great teachers and great principals. And again, I never think monetary rewards alone are the answer because it's not what motivates people to come in. But if a great teacher goes to work in a you know, impoverished community, pick 10 grand, 15 grand, 20 grand, pick a number, I think that's a great investment. Pick a number for a principal, I think that's a great investment. That's a piece of it. The bigger thing is how do we create real career ladders? How do we help support and retain great talent who burn out? Uh, historically, many great teachers who are doing a great job to make more money had to leave teaching to go be an administrator and leave what they love best and do best. So how do we sort of put a master rung in there, master mentor teachers, uh, and, and better utilize those skills? How do we put teams of folks together? What teachers constantly talk about, the reason they leave teaching, it's like 10th on their list is, is the money. It's a lack of support. It's a lack of, you know, a lack of a team, lack of camaraderie, lack of real meaningful professional development. So how do we think fundamentally about those working conditions? And so much of it comes down to great principles, which we haven't talked enough about today, creating that climate where it works. The, the other piece that I, um, is really important for me to mention is we've lost many really talented folks who couldn't go into education because they couldn't afford to pay back their college loans on a teacher's salary. And this has changed, and people should know this, and we've got to really get out there and promote it. As of July 1st, there's a new law. It's income-based repayment, IR, uh, IBR, income-based repayment. Going forward, anyone who graduates who goes into public service teaching, you know, non-for-profits work for government, will have their loan repayments indexed to their income. And so there'll be significant reductions, and after 10 years of public service or, t or 10 years of teaching, those loans will be erased, will go away. So we need to not just get better folks in. So I'm convinced we can get many great folks in who would have loved to have taught and would have loved to follow their heart but couldn't afford the 60 or 80 or $100,000 loans and you know, chase some other more lucrative profession. We can get them in, but to your point, how do we keep and retain that great talent? And I'd go one step further. How do we get that best talent to go to our inner city communities and our rural communities? How do we close not just the achievement gap, but that talent gap, that opportunity gap? We have to have a huge focus on that and do some things very differently. Last question, ma'am. Thank you, Mr. Secretary, for the fine work that you're doing. My question is about the African-American males and school achievement. No Child Left Behind currently identifies African-American students as a subgroup, but there's another subgroup within that subgroup that is crying out for our attention, the African-American males. They receive more suspensions and expulsions than any other group in our nation today. They are significantly disproportionately overrepresented in, overrepresented in special education, and African-American males um, achieve significantly below their peers. I know the answer is multifaceted. It involves partnerships between the parent and the home, the church and the community, and the school. Now, the parent involvement program where I work has achieved measurable success. Our black boys move from Fs and Ds to As and Bs when the parents embrace the lifestyle changes that we recommend. This type of parent involvement program and others can be incorporated into more of our schools. There is so much more that our schools can do for the African-American male. So my question is, how do you feel about the federal government offering incentives to schools that develop programs, policies, and practices that specifically target the African-American male student? Well, we have, again, we have $10 billion on the table <laughs> to raise the bar and to close the gap. And what we're doing as a country, largely for African-American males, is woefully inadequate. And we have to do some things very, very differently. So those partnerships that you talk about are absolutely key. Um, I worry a lot about our young men, both African-American and Latino, where dad isn't there, where mom might be struggling. So I'd even challenge you a bit where there's some strength at home. That's one thing where there's a lack of you know, capacity in that household. How do we as a community, the nonprofits, the social service agencies, the churches step in, and provide the mentoring support. 
when we don't do it for seven, eight, nine, ten year olds, the guys on the street corners are. They're beating us to it. They're out competing us. And that's a huge, huge problem. And uh, that the final thing I would say is that I mentioned it. One of my biggest concerns is the lack of African American and Latino teachers. We have, you know, 35 percent nationwide population of African American. African-American Latino students, that's obviously growing. 15% of our teachers are African-American Latino. 2% of our teachers are African-American male. So I challenge you and challenge all to think about how do we grow our own? How do we get the next generation of great black Latino men to step up and say, I want to teach, and I want to teach in the elementary schools. We have lots of schools where there's one black man, K to eight. That's not good for our black children, it's not good for our white children, it's not good for our Latino children. So we have to really think about how we get the next, gener next generation of leadership to step up. Thank you so much for having me today. Thanks for your hard work. And again, I never think monetary rewards alone are the answer because it's not what motivates people to come in. But if a great teacher goes to work in a you know impoverished community. Pick 10 grand, 15 grand, 20 grand, pick a number. I think that's a great investment. Pick a number for a principal. I think that's a great investment. That's a piece of it. The bigger thing is how do we create real career ladders? How do we help support and retain great talent who burn out? Uh, historically, many great teachers who are doing a great job to make more money had to leave teaching to go be an administrator and leave what they love best and do best. So how do we sort of put a master rung in there, master and mentor teachers, uh, and, and better utilize those skills? How do we put teams of folks together? What teachers constantly talk about, the reason they leave teaching, it's like 10th on their list is, is the money. It's a lack of support. It's a lack of, you know, a lack of a team, lack of camaraderie, lack of real meaningful professional development. So how do we think fundamentally about those working conditions? And so much of it comes down to great principles, which we haven't talked enough about today, creating that climate where it works. The, the other piece that I, um, is really important for me to mention is we've lost many really talented folks who couldn't go into education because they couldn't afford to pay back their college loans on a teacher's salary. And this has changed, and people should know this, and we've got to really get out there and promote it. As of July 1st, there's a new law. It's income-based repayment, IR, uh, IBR, income-based repayment. Going forward, anyone who graduates who goes into public service teaching, you know, non-for-profits work for government will have their loan repayments indexed to their income. And so there'll be significant reductions, and after 10 years of public service or, or 10 years of teaching, those loans will be erased, will go away. So we need to not just get better folks in. So I'm convinced we can get many great folks in who would have loved to have taught and would have loved to follow their heart, but couldn't afford the sixty, eighty, dollars hundred thousand dollar loans and you know chase some other more lucrative profession. We can get them in, but to your point, how do we keep and retain that great talent? And I'd go one step further. How do we get that best talent to go to our inner city communities and our rural communities? How do we close not just the achievement gap, but that talent gap, that opportunity gap? We have to have a huge focus on that and do some things very differently. Last question, ma'am. Thank you, Mr. Secretary, for the fine work that you're doing. My question is about the African-American males and school achievement. No Child Left Behind currently identifies African-American students as a subgroup. But there's another subgroup within that subgroup that is crying out for our attention, the African-American males. They receive more suspensions and expulsions than any other group in our nation today. They are significantly disproportionately overrepresented in, overrepresented in special education, and African-American males um, achieve significantly below their peers. I know the answer is multifaceted. It involves partnerships between the parent and the home, the church and the community, and the school. Now, the parent involvement program where I work has achieved measurable success. Our black boys move from Fs and Ds to As and Bs when the parents embrace the lifestyle changes that we recommend. This type of parent involvement program and others can be incorporated into more of our schools. There is so much more that our schools can do for the African-American male. So my question is, how do you feel about the federal government offering incentives to schools that develop programs, policies, and practices that specifically target the African-American male student? Well, we have, again, we have $10 billion on the table to raise the bar and to close the gap. And what we're doing as a country, largely for African-American males, is woefully inadequate. And we have to do some things very, very differently. So those partnerships that you talk about are absolutely key. 
Um, I worry a lot about our young men, both African American and Latino, where dad isn't there, where mom might be struggling. So I'd even challenge you a bit where there's some strength at home. That's one thing where there's a lack of you know, capacity in that household. How do we as a community, the nonprofits, the social service agencies, the churches step in, and provide the mentoring support? When we don't do it for seven, eight, nine, and ten year olds, the guys in the street corners are. They're beating us to it, they're out competing us, and that's a huge, huge problem. And uh, that the final thing I would say is that I mentioned it, one of my biggest concerns is the lack of African American and Latino teachers. We have, you know, 35% nationwide population of African American. African-American Latino students, that's obviously growing. 15% of our teachers are African-American Latino. 2% of our teachers are African-American male. So I challenge you and challenge us to think about how do we grow our own? How do we get the next generation of great black Latino men to step up and say, I want to teach, and I want to teach in their elementary schools. We have lots of schools where there's one black man, K to eight. That's not good for our black children, it's not good for our white children, it's not good for our Latino children. So we have to really think about how we get the next, gener next generation of leadership to step up. Thank you so much for having me today. Thanks for your hard work. I'm, I'm really honored to be here. This place is remarkable, with remarkable history, and the future is going to be even better. Let me introduce one of the people who's making that future so bright, Lori Tish, the Vice Chair of the Teachers College Board of Trustees. Lori? Uh, good afternoon, and thank you so much, Secretary Duncan, for articulating a powerful and compelling vision of teacher preparation that serves the needs of all children and will help them to realize their potential. I'm so very proud to serve as vice, uh, to serve as the vice chairman of the Board of Teachers College, which, as you mentioned, is already in the vanguard of fulfilling that vision. Not least through the generous federal grant the college recently received to create a teacher residency program in high need New York City schools. I'm also so very proud that the Laurie M. Tisch Illumination Fund is supporting the college's efforts. Teachers College Office of School and Community Partnerships, which the Illumination Fund is supporting with a $1 million grant, is providing access and opportunity to children in schools throughout Harlem. Through these partnerships, the college is making its expertise available to the community and among schools of education and universities in general sharing accountability for the success of the partnership schools. This work truly exemplifi exemplifies the notion of public-private partnerships, which I believe, and I think we all believe, is essential to bringing about beneficial changes to society. So thank you again, Secretary Duncan. You and we truly hold the nation's futures in our hands. Let's work together in the years ahead to make sure that the future is as bright a one as possible. Thank you. Uh The preceding program was brought to you by Teachers College, Columbia University. Please visit us online at itunes.tc.columbia.edu.